We're going to uh, launch into our broader panel discussion. Uh, this first question is for Sanjay, Craig, and Dave. And we'll start with Sanjay. What do you believe to be the biggest challenges to cure today? And uh, please keep your responses to a minute. And before you answer, Sanjay, um, to the audience, uh, you can submit any question you might have through the Q&A function. So uh, please uh, hit that if you can. Uh, Sanjay, what, what, where, where are the challenges for you, or the biggest one? So the biggest challenge, I think, in achieving cure is picking up cancer at an early enough stage in its natural growth for it to be able to be eliminated forever. And that can only be achieved in many cancers through cancer screening. So as an oncologist, I treat patients with advanced stage four disease all the time. And, you know, nothing upsets me more and seeing patients in whom the opportunity to pick up a cancer earlier has been missed for whatever reason. And we have this opportunity to pick up cancer early through cancer screening. It is the one biggest thing that we can all do as human beings to improve our chances of cure. So if you ask me what that one issue is, it's picking up the cancer early and implementation of screening for cancer to pick it up before the patient knows it's there. And that's certainly one of the big areas of innovation um, in liquid biopsies and early detection in the past uh, couple of years that uh, could supplement the, the screening programs we already have. Uh, Craig, what is your thoughts on this? Your, yeah, on? I, would, um, I would say that it's access um, and, and equal access to the 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 innovations unto everyone. Um, you know, do you really cure a disease if you have people who are are, are left behind with it? Um, you know, have we really cured smallpox, which you know, which every which I think we've had it cured. You know, since uh, I think 2020, oh, uh, 2001 but there's still people that have that disease um, because of access. And so I, I would say that the, the thing that, you know, keeps me up at night um, is, does everyone, you know, benefit from the, the clinical trials that we're doing today? Will everybody have access to that? Dave, how do you look uh, at this issue? Well, I think as a starting point, and I agree with, with both Craig and Sanjay on their comments. I, I think what I see is the optimism that I wanna start with is that neither of them have questioned that the technology, the data will be there to be able to actually uh, combat the cancer. And so I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't see any more the biggest challenge being the uh, the science. I actually think that I have optimism that the science is going to actually uh, win the day here. I, I do agree, and perhaps it's my bias within sort of what I spend my time on every day, but I, I think it's how do we make sure that what we can do either in labs or in the clinic, we can deliver, for lack of a better term, in the real world. And I do agree. I think screening is kind of number one on that list for me. And I think that um, access is, is probably number two, uh, just in order of chronology, uh, that we've got to go through those. I do think that there's a, a, a third that to my mind kind of gets to a point that Elizabeth made. She had said, uh, with some levity that she, she, she had hoped that our panelists would, 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 would potentially be her team. I think that it's important to also remember the delivery of all therapeutics. It's multimodality. It's not just about a therapy. It's, it's, you know, it's surgery together with radiation, together with what I think was being articulately talked about survivorship and nurse navigation. And I, I think that, you know, not to make light of it, it's a team sport in terms of how we provide individual care. And that includes the people that are around the patient. So I think that's all factors into how can we get the outcomes in the real world to reflect what we see in the trial. That, that I think is the biggest challenge. Thanks very much uh, for 
our next question will bring in Jonathan, Elizabeth, and Christian um, in that order. Jonathan, we'll start with you. In your area of expertise, uh, what action do you see as a priority in terms of improving the chance for, for cure moving forward? Yeah, great question. I think um, sort of Sanjay and uh, and Craig said it with the idea of uh, and Dave with the idea of screening, early detection, access to molecular testing. No doubt, uh, extremely important. But I'll give you a quick story about a, pa a couple of patients uh, that I've treated recently. Uh, one one was a patient who was treated on a trial, received a preoperative immunotherapy. I operated on him, complete resection. Uh, complete response to the preoperative treatment. So really there was no, the disease had been completely eliminated by, by the, the immunotherapy. And I'm seeing him a few months after, and he is just completely depressed. Um, I'm telling him, look, you, 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 we've been able to cure this disease. Uh, I, I don't understand. Okay, tell me more about what's going on. And after further investigations, he, he was unconsolable. And it turns out that he had developed an immune-related adverse event and developed some hypothyroidism that was unrecognized, which can cause depression on its own. And now he was living with this uh, consequence of treatment. Another patient, similar story, um, who's cured of her cancer, but living with longstanding uh, consequences of the of therapy. So. It, it, I don't think it's specific just to my area, but one of the things we do in oncology is we keep adding more and more and more uh, treatments because we have a, a tough beast to, to tackle. Um, but I think de-escalation of care, finding ways to uh, remove certain things that aren't bringing benefit, finding ways to limit the adverse events that are incurred by the treatments is, is vitally important. And, and that can only be achieved through these ideas of early detection, molecular testing for precision therapeutics, and, and the endpoints issue of, of finding endpoints that allow us to remove things that aren't helping uh, earlier and adding things that are faster. Biology is hard, huh? <laughs> uh, Elizabeth? Um, sure, yeah, to put a finer point on everything that's been said so far, which I agree with, I would say that there actually is no such thing as cure without equity period, hard stop, right? We cannot cure cancer for some patients, and we know who those patients would be. They would be wealthier patients, more highly educated patients. We would see people of color being left behind, immigrants, people who speak a different language, the folks who are often left behind by the healthcare system. I don't wanna see a system of haves and have nots, and I worry that when we see this rapid innovation, it's going to benefit a certain group of people in our society. And so I want to make sure that when we talk about cure, we are absolutely talking about cure for all and not just cure for the people who have access to it. And so I think it's extraordinarily important to think about cure in that context of cure for every single person who walks through our doors. And Christian, what is your, uh, what is your view on the challenges? You know, you know, Ron. Uh, my my job today currently is uh, developing cancer medicines. This, this is what I'm doing, and there is one thing that I uh, I believe we have uh, uh, learned. We are learning from this uh, devastating uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. We have seen an incredible response of everyone of every parties working together as fast as possible uh, to bring uh, you know, effective uh, treatments, vaccines, to patients uh, in, uh, in, in a time that was uh, not even conceivable before. 10 years before to develop a vaccine, we did in, in one year to th this time. So at AstraZeneca, uh, as an oncology community, we, I really would like to see us working with the same level of urgency. Because I believe that oncology is incredibly important. The needs are incredibly high. Uh, we need them, and we need to do this and not alone. We need to do this in an integrated approach. I think Dave was mentioning it is a team sport. Uh, and I believe that uh, if we are able, if we will be able to bring this level of energy and, 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 and concept of uh, integrated working together, I think we can progress things much, much faster. This is what I really would like to see and what I really hope that we will be able to do going are ahead. There, are there sort of some specific uh, lessons or specific uh, ways that, that the experience with uh, the vaccine have 
that I've identified that, that can be applied to cancer research, do you think? Absolutely. First, 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 first of all, we learned that uh, we need to do what uh, uh, it is important to be done. So, and we are actually implementing this also in, uh, in our oncology programs, uh, uh, really being focused on the important question and try to get the answer for those questions. Secondly, I think, uh, and now going back a little bit to the topic of today, when we are thinking about cures, when we are thinking about uh, uh, aiming for uh, the, 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 the biggest uh, uh, outcome, uh, we are probably in a setting like early disease settings where we are struggling with endpoints. So we are having uh, uh, endpoints, we are using endpoints uh, that takes too long to read out. And even when we have a very effective drugs, uh, sometimes it takes too long to, to, to run the trial and to have the readout of the trial. So what can we do better here? These are some specific examples that, for instance, with the vaccine, all these emergency approvals and these uh, very quick readouts, ultimately taking some kind of risk, but ultimately bring the, 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 the treatment to the patients uh, very quickly. So we have a question from the audience uh, for Craig uh, and Christian. How do we achieve making trials uh, and research more diverse? Addressing this the access question uh, front and center, I think. In line with today's discussion, is diversity in clinical trials important when we're thinking about a cure in cancer? Oh, this, is, <laughs> this question is at the the heart. My, I bet you that's from my wife because I, I probably would ask her um, to like send in a question um, because that so near and dear to my heart. And that was really, you know, kind of the, the, the point that I was going to make is that we really, it, in order to pick out the cancer cell from the normal cell, it takes an incredible amount of precision to be able to do that. And, and these new medications and a new fantastic drugs that we have are incredibly precise, but that precision isn't universal, universally um, applicable. And so we have to make clinical trials uh, with a diverse population in order to assure that this benefits everyone when it rolls out into the real world. To test it in one group of, of people, the easiest to, to accrue, may mean that it may not be applicable to others. What I always tell the residents and, and fellows and medical students is that when you look at a paper to talk about cure to a patient, you have to be certain that the patient that's in that paper is a direct reflection of the patient in front of you, or else it's not applicable. And you can only achieve that by diversity of clinical trials. And that is in the, the critical nature of that I think is making sure that the investigators are aware and prioritize that, that you're, that it's not the easiest patients that you need to put in a clinical trial, but the necessary patients that should be, that you should um, offer a clinical trial um, and making sure the clinical trials are just not at the biggest institutions, diverse through all the communities that will have access to it. Ron, if I could just jump in on that, because I, I agree, it, it's such an important question. Um, I have the fortune of overseeing uh, lung cancer care in a publicly health, uh, publicly funded healthcare system up here in Canada. We oversee about 2 million uh, uh, people in our area, and the geography is massive. Uh, it's uh, you have the landmass of Quebec, which is like uh, twice France, if you uh, measure it out, and and we have all kinds of ethnicities and people represented. The Inuit, who are, who are way up at the top of the province, have the highest incidence of lung cancer of any ethnic uh, population in the world. And you can just, I, I'm sure it's obvious to you how challenging it would be to bring any infused therapies, surgery, radiation therapy to people living in these remote regions. And that's within a system where, where everyone has equal access to, to healthcare regardless of uh, income. Or, so, so bringing therapeutics uh, regardless of geography, orally available agents, making things more easily administered is, is incredibly important, allowing for molecular testing to be performed in a, a lightweight way where there aren't too many barriers to get, getting done, extremely, extremely important. 
and it's achievable. You know, we've been able to implement reflex molecular testing here in Quebec for, for not, not very much money per patient. It, it can be done. Christian, your thoughts on uh, uh, diversity? Difficult to add anything, but uh, I can simply say we are taking this incredibly seriously. Uh, uh, we, we, we want to develop uh, our drugs uh, uh, globally. And uh, I, I, I think uh, Craig said very, very uh, uh, nicely, I mean, uh, there is a genomic diversity uh, across ethnicity and you need to have in your clinical trials, uh, uh, the, the, the patient that represented the, these ethnicities because you need to have the, the, the answer. And I, agree, and I agree with Jonathan, it is possible. It is possible to, in, to increase the diversity in our clinical trials. We need, we need to find a way to, to, to do this better, definitely. But we are very committed on this. So we have time for one more question. Uh, so we'll uh, ask for Sanjay, Elizabeth, and Dave to take a crack at this one, which is given uh, all the energy that's been devoted to um, one disease over the past year in particular, where do you think money most effectively can be spent to make sure we get to a cure quicker? Sanjay? Well, I'm a believer in cancer screening. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Equity to uh, cancer screening is going to be one of the biggest uh, ways of curing more people. But it's not just screening through more scans. We've got novel technologies with blood-based biomarkers coming through. Uh, we've heard from Dave that science isn't going to be the barrier, and I'm a strong believer that science is not going to be the barrier. We have novel technologies. So I think access to early screening technologies is really where we want to be starting to uh, set the benchmark. Elizabeth? Yeah, I, I agree with Sanjay, but I'll take, take it even one step earlier in the process, and that's around prevention, right? If we can prevent cancer, um, but it's not that easy, right? We know some things that are really important to prevent cancer, eating healthy foods, moving your body, staying at a healthy weight, not smoking. Those things seem straightforward, but they're not. We're all human beings with a complex set of behavioral um, aspects to our life and different abilities and different resources. So we need, again, to support all communities to be able to prevent cancer, to be able to eat healthy foods and move their bodies and feel safe in their communities. And so this is a bigger health equity and social justice issue than just the medical and physical component of cancer. Dave, you get the last word. Oh, well, that's that's kind. I appreciate it. I, I think maybe just with the, the, the short time that we have, what I would say is I think there's an opportunity to connect with Sanjay and Elizabeth, you both just said there which is I actually think that screening and prevention, or at least some prevention can go hand in hand. This notion that actually, if we find risk factors where smoking is a huge risk factor for so many cancer types, and if we can find ways to effectively screen those portions of the population, but put smoking cessation together, even for those that are unscreened, I think that that's a practical way for us to begin to tackle some of the things that you've talked through. I, uh, I guess my last word on this is that I do think that there's been a lot of collateral damage from the pandemic in terms of people missing routine visits and uh, ignoring symptoms that they were otherwise showing up at the uh, hospital or at their physician's office. And I think we've missed uh, uh, as many as tens of thousands of uh, cancer diagnoses during the course of the last year uh, across the globe. And so I, I do think that it's important that we remember cancer didn't stop during the pandemic. And I hope that uh, if there's one action that people can take tomorrow on this is that they make sure that uh, they're directing their own approach to making sure that they take care of themselves because that leads to either er uh, prevention or early detection. I think it's essentially important. So um, I appreciate Ron very much that question. Well, I'd like to thank you all for a terrific conversation. I'm thinking that uh, maybe we can leave that pitcher alone and spent with a no hitter alone on the bench in the seventh inning, but uh, maybe we can bring the word cure compassionately and honestly and fruitfully into the conversation with uh, patients and uh, the community uh, going forward. So thank you all again very much. It was a great conversation. Mm -hmm.